Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone connecting with us today. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Natalie Campbell. I'm Senior Director for North American Government and Regulatory Affairs at the Internet Society. And I'm joined here today by Ryan Pope, who is Director of Internet Policy. Today, we're going to be talking about a couple of bills in the U.S. that threaten encryption and in doing so are putting children at risk. So first of all, why should people care about encryption, especially people whose you know, roles are jobs or as parents, people who have responsibilities to keep children safe, both online and in real life? Well, encryption essentially is a crucial tool to help keep our lives safe, both online and in real life. For anyone who doesn't know what encryption is, it's essentially a way to ensure that our information is kept private and confidential with respect to um, private messaging, especially with the use of end-to-end -end encryption. It's a way that, you know, myself as a parent, I can use an end-to-end -end encrypted app to communicate with my kids and ensure that the only people who have the keys to be able to understand those messages are myself and the intended recipient, which would be my kids. Not even the company would be able to access what that communication is. And that's important for a lot of reasons. We all know that there's an increasing amount of data being both generated and collected online and used for a whole lot of different purposes, whether that's marketing or surveillance or, you know, ending up in the hands of, of bad actors who want to use it for really bad reasons. Encryption is crucial. It lets us do things like online shopping, as I mentioned, communications, you know, having appointments with your medical doctor and know that, you know, the communications and the things and data that we're sharing are secure and confidential and private. So, you know, a lot of the times that we talk about encryption and that we see, you know, when we're talking about bills that undermine the use of encryption, we worry about this, especially because, I mean, as parents, as in my role at the Internet Society, there is nothing that is more important to me than making sure that there are safe spaces for everybody online and especially for kids online, which is why I'm such a huge advocate of encryption. But throughout my life as a parent, as a former trustee on a school board, I've seen especially why encryption is so crucial for kids when, you know, they need it most, when they need a lifeline. I mean, with respect to our day-to-day -day lives, as I mentioned before, when I talk to my kids, and I mean, I'm constantly, <laughs> constantly trying to empower them on how to be safe online without restricting and monitoring their activities 100%. And that needs to adapt as they get older, right? It's like swimming lessons, right? We give our kids lessons on purpose so that eventually, maybe not when they're babies, but eventually one day they can go swimming and do so. And we know that we have done all that we can to empower them to manage the risks and to mitigate the risks. Well, likewise with, you know, internet use online, myself as a parent, I've tried to empower my kids by helping them understand how to manage risk online because you can never separate the risk from completely separate the risk from use of the internet but encryption is one of those tools that is crucial to making sure that there are safe spaces for them online and especially when it comes to you know communicating with myself or family members about things like their private schedules when they finish school what school they go to, you know, what time is swim practice, what's appropriate places to bring your cell phone and to use apps to share things like pictures, etc. All of this generates data, especially when we're not using end-to-end -end encryption, and they could be really, really dangerous in the wrong hands. And encryption is one way to help make sure that family communications are private family communications. Another example I mentioned before, I've had the unfortunate but fortunate experience to understand 
how important end-to-end -end encryption is keeping kids safe, especially those who are at risk and have been in situations of domestic violence. When I was a school board trustee in a northern community of 3,500 people, there were heightened instances of domestic violence in a town of 3,500. And if you can just imagine how small of a town that is and what it's like as a parent to ensure that, you know, you keep your kids out of the way of family members that might be those perpetrating the domestic violence, it is really hard in a small town of 3,500 to do that. However, encrypted communications can be an extremely effective tool to coordinate how to get yourself and kids to safety, how to ensure that you're not in a path of abusers, how you can reach out to helplines to make sure that you have escape plans and that you have all the supports that you need to keep yourself and your children out of harm's way. I've seen this firsthand, the difference it can make, especially in, in small towns, as I said, where it's absolutely critical because it's all too easy for the intimate details of your personal and family lives to fall into the hands of those who will use that information to do harm. And I mean, there's other ways too, right? There are children right now who face persecution just for loving who they love, just for being themselves and encrypted communications are ways that they can communicate with one another, learn more about themselves, have access to information online to help understand what's happening and explore different issues without fear of being outed or persecuted by whoever it may be um, that could do so. It's extremely crucial, especially, you know, if we go back to the instance again, if you're living in a small community and there might not be, you know, communities of like-minded folks or, or otherwise physically in the community, there are ways to reach out to sources of information uh, and people who are like you that are online and to do so in safe spaces where you can help prevent communications that are being shared from getting into the wrong hands who might want to exploit that information for a variety of reasons. So, I mean, as a parent, I've come across these situations and I've seen firsthand how encrypted communications is so crucial, even for things like sharing medical information, right? We're seeing in the news lately cases where parents that are sharing photos of their children to doctors to help diagnose certain conditions have been flagged as, you know, for nudity. And, you know, there are legitimate reasons to be worried about the spread of child sexual abuse material online, but there are also very important reasons to be able to share, you know, information about your kids with trusted health professionals in a way that that does not get into the wrong hands, especially if we think about during COVID, right? How many of us were privileged enough to be able to have doctor's appointments online or for our children? Or likewise, if you're living in a small community, like I was up north, and you have very limited in-community sources to mental health professionals, you absolutely rely on encrypted communications to be able to get the help that you need in a private and confidential way. So this is a lot of, I've just ran through a lot of different examples of why myself as a parent, as a former school board trustee, as someone who has responsibilities to keep kids online, why encryption is so crucial and why I'm such a strong advocate. But now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Ryan Polk, who's going to tell you a bit about some of the U.S. bills that are concerned to us, both in terms of Internet security, but also in terms of, you know, undermining our ability as parents, as caregivers, as people who have responsibilities to keep kids safe online, how that undermines our ability to do so. So over to you, Ryan, to to give us a summary of, of the bills that we're worried about. Thanks, Adeline. Thanks for going through all those amazing ways that 
encryption, especially strong encryption, like end to end encryption is important for pe- keeping people and kids safe online. I see a lot of folks have joined, so that's great. And I see a lot of familiar f- faces, including some people who probably def- actually definitely know more than me on these bills. And so we might ask some of you all to step up to the plate and, and speak some about the bills and, and what where you think they're going. But I can attempt to give a quick rundown of, of what these bills are that we're worried about, because right now there's really four in the United States that we're the most worried about. But taking a step back, I want to jump to kind of the overall encryption debate. So encryption's under threat all around the world. Every single continent, there have been attempts, maybe except Antarctica, to undermine encryption just in the last few years. In Europe, you have the anti-CSAM regulation that they're trying to put through in the European Union that could potentially undermine encryption. In the United Kingdom, there's the online safety bill, which similarly is a threat to encryption. In Brazil, there's a court case going on now on whether or not the judicial system can order that WhatsApp be blocked because they didn't provide encrypted data to law enforcement. This is a case that's been going on for many years, I believe. We're getting close to five years now, still not wrapped up. Um, and similarly, in other places, like uh, in, in India, um, encryption is under dire threat uh, with their new rules around um, in their IT act. Um, and in Africa as well, there's been several laws that have been passed that threaten encryption. Nigeria has recently been looking at laws that could uh, change how they uh, regulate the Internet and create new requirements on platforms and internet service providers, which could, again, undermine encryption. So in the midst of all of this, we have the U.S., where in the Senate right now, there's four bills that each of them threaten encryption, kind of to different degrees and in different ways, but the end result is the same, which is that companies will be disincentivized from using end-to-end encryption. So what are these bills? The There's the Earn It Act, the Stop CSAM Act, the Kids Online Safety Act, and then recently the Cooper Davis Act. And I'll run through these generally in that order. So the first one is the Earn It Act. So the Earn It Act is a a bill that seeks to change how intermediary liability is done in the United States. Basically, right now in the United States, you have platforms that are protected from intermediary liability. So basically, they, they are protected from liability for what's being sent across their platforms to a degree. And that's governed by Section 230, part of our our laws here in the United States. What the Earn It Act does is basically it will make it so that companies have to, platforms have to prove that they're trying to stop child sexual abuse material from going across their platforms or being shared on their platforms enough in order to maintain that protection from intermediary liability. If they don't, they could be found criminally liable for child abuse material being sent across their network. And also there's, I believe it would allow states as well to create regulations and, and try to find these companies and platforms liable for, criminally liable for the child sexual abuse material going across their platforms. So on the face of it, this seems like it might be a good idea, but the problem is that with end-to-end encryption, there's no way to provide access to a third party to monitor the content going across a service without breaking end-to-end encryption and weakening the security and privacy for everyone on those platforms. So for instance, if you're Signal or you're using Signal to protect your communications for many of the reasons that Natalie has laid out for us, if the Earn Act passes, Signal could be held liable, could be found liable for any bad material being sent across their network unless they make changes to their system that would allow allow them to monitor and search for bad content being sent across their network. And then if they make those changes, the security and privacy of the millions of people who are using that end-to-end encrypted service is er obliterated. And so that's a really, really bad outcome. So whereas the Earn It Act is focused on criminal liability, the Stop CSAM Act actually 
focuses on civil liability. So the Stop CSIM Act basically does much the same thing in that it requires platforms to be able to show that they're doing their due diligence on protecting children on their platforms and stopping child sexual abuse material from being sent across their networks or their platforms. But what it actually does instead, what it does instead of the Earn It Act is it actually allows victims of child sexual abuse material to sue any platform or any communication service provider who helped facilitate the spread or sharing of that instance of CSAM. And so rather than creating criminal liability, it creates civil liability. And the problem here is the same as Earn It Act. With an end-to-end -end encrypted service, you can't actually monitor the content without breaking the encryption that's being used to protect it and leaving everyone, again, at risk and creating an insecure product. You're basically creating a vulnerability that you can't patch. And with the Stop CSAM Act in particular, the way that it's written, this would apply to infrastructure providers as well. So everyone from a network operator to an internet exchange point to the platform that's actually being used. So for instance, Signal, all of these could be sued by victims of child sexual abuse material. And so it creates this huge incentive across the internet system to weaken the, the security and privacy of all of those systems. And this is particularly dangerous as well for infrastructure providers because infrastructure providers already don't have access to content. More often than not now, in, when data is sent across the internet, even if it's not end-to-end -end encrypted, it is encrypted from point to point. And so the average network operator can't actually see the data that's being sent across their network and actually be able to read it and see the content. And so by creating this new incentive to be able to monitor content at every step of the way across the internet, you actually threaten all of the gains that we've had in terms of security and privacy on the internet at the infrastructure layer since 2013. So the Stop CSAM Act, even though it hasn't gotten as much news as the Earn It Act, is incredibly dangerous in terms of what it can do to help break encryption across the internet. So the next one is the Kids Online Safety Act. And perhaps it's not as explicit of a threat as the first two, but basically it's an attempt to try and get platforms to prevent specific harms against children by stopping them from encountering harmful content. And the concern that we have is that on end-to-end -end encrypted messaging platforms, there might again be that incentive to undermine or, or weaken encryption in order to be able to identify and prevent that content from reaching kids. Because if that content is end-to-end -end encrypted, again, it can't be monitored without breaking the encryption. So those are really the, the kids' safety ones that we are particularly worried about in the United States. But there's a fourth bill in the United States now that people should be aware of, and that's the Cooper Davis Act. So the Cooper Davis Act is aimed at stopping the sale of fentanyl and methamphetamines on the internet. Basically, what it will require is companies to monitor content, user content on their platforms. And if they find drug-related terms or drug sale-related information, they have to send that information to the Drug Enforcement Agency in the United States. So that in and of itself is potentially a, a big violation of the United States Constitution's Fourth Amend Amendment, because they'd be requiring that a uh, private company acts as an agent of the state. And so there's that concern. But there's also a major concern for encryption. And that's because of a change to the, the bill that was recently made in the last week. The bill now says that uh, companies can be found liable if they are seen as willfully blinding themselves to 
the content that's being sent across their platforms. And that language is striking because it sounds very similar to the language that we've heard from law enforcement agencies, particularly in the, in the United States, when it comes to encryption. In the United States, the past five years, we've heard the same refrain from the Department of Justice, FBI, and others saying that when companies roll out and end encryption, they're blinding law enforcement's ability to stop bad guys. And of course, this is a very insane thing to say, because if they're being blind, they're blind because they're staring at the sun in terms of how much data that they actually can collect as law enforcement and help uh, increase their ability to do investigations, even with end-to-end encryption. But when this language was added to the bill, it became clear that that little piece right there is actually aimed directly at end-to-end encryption. Because what it's saying is that if companies use end-to-end encryption, there could be an argument in court that they are willfully blinding themselves to monitoring for drug content being sent across their network. And then they'd be liable, criminally liable for that content being sent across their network. So that's a new danger in terms of bills that could weaken encryption in the United States. And for those of you who are listening, I think a few of you are listening from outside of the U.S., one thing to, to be aware of is that in the United States, if end-to-end encryption is weakened here and companies are really disincentivized to, to use end-to-end encryption, that's going to have an impact on the rest of the world. Because if companies weaken their encryption for a big market like the United States or the EU or the UK, it's likely that they weaken it everywhere. That way they're not offering multiple versions of their product. And so If encryption is threatened, especially in big markets where companies just don't leave, then it's a big threat for encryption users everywhere. So where are these bills in the legislative process and kind of what's next? So the Earn It Act, Stop CSAM Act, the Kids Online Safety Act, and most recently the Cooper Davis Act have all passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. This means that they have had some changes to them. The most important thing is that they now have the ability to be introduced on the Senate floor for a vote. So if Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, decides to, he can say, hey, let's introduce Earn It Act, Stop CSM Act, Cooper Davis Act, or COSA to the Senate floor for a vote, and then move it closer to becoming a law. Or he could introduce pieces of those bills as well in some sort of package. Our concern is that, especially for things like the Cooper Davis Act and the Stop CSAM Act, there hasn't been as much pushback, visible pushback against these bills. All of these bills for legislators are very hard to go against because for some legislators, they could be accused of you know, trying to protect drug dealers or trying to protect pedophiles, etc. And so being able to push back against those bills is very hard for legislators. What we really need to do as a community is make it clear that there's a lot of problems with these bills when it comes to encryption and when it comes to to online safety. Um, Because if any of these bills pass, end-to-end encryption is going to be really threatened in the United States. And so making it clear that these bills are politically toxic and damaging, especially to the communities that that legislators in the United States care about, especially Democratic legislators care about, is very, very important so that Chuck Schumer, our Senate Majority Leader, doesn't decide that he has enough political capital to pass one of these bills. So we're getting closer to an August recess, so there might be a little bit of time, but our concern is that one of these bills could be fast-tracked and attempted to be pushed through pretty quickly. So I wanted to make sure everyone's aware of it. And also, if folks want to jump in now with things that they're doing, I see we have Fight for the Future on and others who have been leading a lot of advocacy against these threatening bills. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on these bills and if there are things that I've missed or if you all have questions um, more generally in the audience, more questions about the bills or encryption in the United States or encryption threats around the world. 
please let let us know and raise your hand or, or write it in the chat. Um, but we're all ears. Thanks for this, Ryan. And we already have some questions starting to come in. I will read the first one. I live in Argentina. Could these encryption bills or efforts to undermine encryption, encryption have an effect for encrypted services here? I think you touched on this, Ryan. Do you want to expand a bit on this question? Sure thing. We've luckily not had to have too many examples of this so far, but whenever an anti-encryption bill passes, there's always a question of what happens next. And companies who offer end-to-end -end encryption services kind of have a choice. They can either leave the market, attempt to stay in the market until they get sued or, or fined, or they can comply with the law. And I think for companies, this calculus changes depending on how big the market is in terms of, of their customer base and also how egregious the law is or, or, or how um, maybe authoritarian the, the country is. Um, Companies, I think, are disincentivized from creating multiple versions of their product. They don't want to have to have a U.S. version, a U.K. version, a uh, European Union version, a Brazilian version, an Argentinian version of their product, because that's really expensive. You have to do support and updates for all of those. And if all of those have fairly big differences in terms of privacy and security, then that could be really, really expensive. And so one thing that you could see if some of these countries like the United States pass laws like this are some companies making the choice of leaving the market, in which case that might not directly impact the security of you living in Argentina and using these products, but it could make it harder for you to communicate across those products to people in the United States or other countries if they pass laws like this. Also, if one of those companies makes the opposite choice and decides to comply with the law, it's likely that they break encryption for all of their users and not just for American users. And so that's one thing to keep in mind is that when the, these laws pass, if these laws pass, I should say, hopefully they won't, here in the United States, or for instance, the online safety bill in the United Kingdom, look to what those companies do. Because I know, for instance, in some places like the United Kingdom recently, WhatsApp said that they wouldn't comply with the online safety bill requirements to break end-to-end -end encryption. Similarly, Signal said the same at a RightsCon in June of this year. Making sure that you follow what happens to those companies and, and how they comply or don't comply is, is really important for your own security, but also just in general of, of hopefully stopping other countries from making these bad decisions. Thank you for that, Ryan. We have another question that's come in. Is there an alternative to weakening encryption to promote child safety online? So I'll answer part of that question and then I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. To, I know you have some thoughts as well. So in terms of things governments can do, there are a lot of things that you can do to support child safety online and prevent the harms we want to prevent without weakening encryption. And I'm speaking partially here with my Internet Society hat on, but partially with my experience as a parent and a former school board trustee on. I think one of the most important things that we can do to support uh, child safety online is digital literacy and especially about how to be safe online. The more that we support educational initiatives, and this could mean baking it right into the curriculum, which I believe personally is very critical for parents as much as children, right, to be able to understand what it is to make use of this wonderful tool that is the internet in a way that is safe and that, you know, our kids know how to spot the red flags, that they know what red flags even look like, how to report the red flags, who to go to with, you know, things that make you feel uncomfortable or scared recognizing these instances and making sure that children know 
what they can do in these situations that are not unlike how we train our kids what to do when they encounter stranger danger in real life. We absolutely have to be having these conversations and baking in this education into their lives and parents' lives as much as we can. It is our duty as parents to empower kids to be able to thrive in the world. And that world is increasingly online. It's increased like we cannot, you know, <laughs> there, there are instances where we can avoid it. But if we really do want to make sure that our kids have all the tools that they need to be able to thrive as individuals, that means empowering them to be able to make use of the internet in safe and secure ways to the extent that's possible. I go back to the example about swimming, right? Learning how to swim is a life skill. It is a crucial safety skill. You're not just going to throw your kids in the water and expect them to be able to swim and thrive. We have to teach them. We can put them in swimming lessons and we can supervise and gradually as they learn how to swim, as they get older and know about the risks and how to avoid them, we have more trust in being able to give them more independence. And that's going to look different for everyone. But giving them that education in the first place is absolutely crucial and absolutely underfunded at the moment. And there's a lack of attention on this aspect of promoting child safety online. And I mean, even just teaching kids how to look for apps that have strong privacy settings. Why are privacy settings important? I had a conversation with my eight-year-old just last week who hears me talk about this issue all the time, but we hadn't had the conversation yet about what research mommy does to make sure that you're using apps that are going to keep private information confidential and secure he was on his app store and it was like, oh, look, here's a report on this app's privacy settings. And I was amazed that he would just figured out how to even start to finding out about that information on his own. And so kids can have these conversations, even at year, eight years old, we can make this information accessible to them. But that does need to be part of the solution. There's no silver bullet to solving child safety online and curbing the spread of the worst material that is very triggering and very horrible and that we all want to prevent. There's no one way to do it. It has to be a holistic approach. But I'll pass it over to Ryan, who I know has some really good ideas on, you know, things that tech companies can do, things that other stakeholders decided to do as part of this holistic approach to creating safer spaces for kids online. Sure. And just to note that I've added Evan Greer to the speaker list and Evan, we'll go to you next because I know you all have done a lot of work around these bills in the United States, but I'll just quickly jump in on one of the, the techniques that I see as being much more end-to-end -end encryption respecting that tech companies can do as part of the solution. And it has to be done in tandem with better training and, and education for users, but that's speed bumps. So this concept of a speed bump is basically creating a pop-up, for instance, of, are you sure you want to do this when a user is engaging in an activity that could be potentially damaging? So for instance, if a user is receiving a picture and it's an underage user who's receiving a picture and the picture appears to be a nude picture, potentially adding a pop-up that says, hey, this looks like a nude picture. Do you really want to receive this and see this. Similarly, if a user is sending an image and it looks like a nude picture, again, a pop-up saying, hey, do you really want to send this? This looks like a, a nude photo. And just adding that quick speed bump saying, hey, do you really want to do this? And maybe even explaining why this could be a bad thing to do is a really important tool, I believe, for helping stop the proliferation of of child sexual abuse materials online. And in terms of end-to-end of -end encryption, I think this is actually a really interesting technique because you could do this as a scanning of sorts, but it's a scanning that doesn't notify any third party. No third party would ever know whether or not that pop-up popped up, 
basically it's just processing that happens on the app or the device in the flow of encrypting your message. This is very different from so-called client-side scanning that has been thought up by especially law enforcement communities as a potential, quote, solution, which it really isn't, in that with client-side scanning as law enforcement would have it, a notification would be sent to law enforcement or to someone else saying, hey, there was an image that looked like a nude image of a child being sent, or there was communications, text messages that seemed weird, here's a copy of the text message in hashed form, which is very dangerous for security and privacy and basically undermines the purpose of end-to-end encryption. What I'm talking about is a lot different in that there is no message, there's no copy or hashed version of the content being sent from the device to anyone else, to any third party. It's just happening in the device itself. And there's been some companies that have talked about doing this in different forms, but creating that speed bump or other ways of doing speed bumps is, I think, an area that needs to have more research and a potential part of the solution, especially paired with education for children and digital literacy education that could be really helpful. But I'll stop my ranting and pass it to Evan, who I know has been doing a lot of work on ERNA Act, Stop CSIM Act, Cooper Davis, et cetera, and encryption more widely. So over to you, Evan. Yeah, thanks so much for organizing this. And thanks for handing me the mic impromptu last minute, but but happy to just quickly chime in and share sort of particularly how folks can get involved. Because like you said, we are very much coming down to the wire here. And there is a concerted and serious effort to try to move some of these bills to the floor in these final days of this congressional session, which ends next week on the 28th. So definitely kind of some pressure and urgency here around these bills. And to that end, I'll actually announce, we haven't actually publicly announced this yet, but we are going to announce shortly that starting on Thursday, Fight for the Future, the ACLU, EFF, and others will be helping organize a week of action to oppose the quote unquote bad internet bills, as we are calling them, which includes all of the bills that have been listed here, as well as Cooper Davis and the Restrict Act. So really, I think it's partly about pushing back, not just on these specific bills, but on the bad thinking behind them. As Ryan and Natalie both pointed out, all of these bills are sort of based in the completely wrong idea that breaking or undermining or disincentivizing platforms from offering end-to-end encryption will make children safer. We know from significant expertise and history and uh, analysis that it will actually make children less safe and not more safe. Um, But I think it's crucial that while we may defeat these bills this week and next week and live to fight another day, the kind of um, problematic thinking behind this legislation certainly lives on. And if anything, has been gaining steam significantly over the last couple of years. And so I think it's really essential that we make a strong showing of grassroots opposition and also that we continue, as we've been doing on this call, to point to alternatives that it, we can't just be the party of no or pretending like everything's fine on the internet. Let's just leave it alone and it will we'll all live in a great cyber libertarian utopia. I think you know fewer and fewer people believe that. And so it's essential that we you know present viable alternatives. So for us at Fight for the Future, we've been even just making strong distinctions that there actually are great internet bills out there that would address some of the types of harms and concerns that folks have raised around big tech platforms, around child exploitation, around data abuse and harvesting, and a wide range of other related issues. We're strong supporters of data privacy legislation. There's antitrust legislation in the US that could do a lot to reduce the power and scope of the largest platforms and create space for better platforms and alternatives to spring up. There's the My Body, My Data Act. There's the Safe Sex Worker Study Act, which would study the failure of SESTA-FOSTA and give Congress more information with which they could use to legislate responsibly in this area. And so I think it's really important that we make it clear that it's not okay for the sponsors of bills like COSA and the Earn It Act to go around pretending like it's either their bill or the alternative is allowing the status quo to continue. We absolutely need to be fighting for legislation and regulation that makes sense and that will make kids safer rather than less safe. 
quickly, I, if it's okay, and I don't have to take up too much more time, I could say a little bit more about COSA specifically. I think that of all the bills that we're talking about here, that perhaps has the most legs, and I think is also one of the least understood, particularly because I think the harms from it are less specifically around encryption and more broadly around how it could lead to widespread censorship of important but controversial topics that young people actually need to be able to discuss and engage in. But I'll pause here so that I don't take up too much time. Happy to touch on that or just be around to answer questions on any of these bills, because as you said, we've been up to our eyeballs in them for quite some time. Thanks, Evan. And that was great. And actually, it would be great to have you say more about the the Kids Online Safety Bill. I also wanted to mention that we have a pinned tweet in the Twitter space as well that has a link to a petition and also advocacy toolkits that might be helpful for folks, including things like a letter to the senators, template, social media copy, and social media assets that folks can use to supplement Fight for the Future and others on the uh, week of action next week. But back to you, Evan, for some more information about the Kids Online Safety Act. That would be great. That's great. We're going to steal all of those materials um, and reuse them so that uh, we can take that off of our list of things we have to create this week, too. So thanks for that. We'll definitely go take a look. I mean, quickly, just before I jumped into the Kids Online Safety Act, I also just wanted to zoom back out to the question folks were asking about like alternatives or what do we do instead. And one of the things that I just think is really essential that we refuse to lose sight of is that most of the folks that are pushing legislation like this could care less about the safety of children. And I think it's really important that we don't accept um, their false frame from the start. I was just reading an article before I came on here about children in Angola prison who are sitting in 113 degree temperatures with no air conditioning and not being allowed out. For some reason, the groups that claim to advocate for children never seem interested in addressing harms like that, but rather interested in pushing for legislation that would lead to censorship of content on the Internet. And so I just think it's important that we reject that kind of false frame and say that if we want to address things like child exploitation, we actually have evidence based mechanisms to do that. Like, for example, we know that one of the biggest sources of child exploitation and predation is LGBTQ children who have unsupportive parents and don't know who they can go to to ask for help when they end up in an uncomfortable or dangerous situation. Something concrete that we could do to actually reduce the amount of CSAM online would be passing LGBTQ rights legislation across the country. But Marsha Blackburn and other legislators that claim that they're trying to protect children are actually doing the exact opposite and pushing for a world where children are less safe and more vulnerable to the types of exploitation that they claim that they're trying to prevent. So I just think it's important that we say that clearly and that we don't show up into this conversation as some kind of like apologetically or in as if it's some ethereal or theoretical debate between these lofty values of free expression and privacy against the concrete harms that are happening to children We are showing up in this debate because we fundamentally believe that legislation like this makes the world less safe for children, not more safe. So I just wanted to say that very, very clearly. And as a concrete example of that, the Kids Online Safety Act, you know, which has a number of problematic provisions, one of the core problems with it is that it creates a duty of care legal requirement for platforms that covers their content recommendation systems. Now, what that means in practice is that state attorneys general, so folks like Ken Paxton or the attorney general of Missouri that recently attempted to ban gender affirming care for adults, will be writing the speech rules for the entire internet. Because what COSA effectively does is it gives state attorneys general the power to dictate what speech platforms can recommend to which users. Now, this is all couched in language around children, And the idea is that platforms should not be recommending content to children that could be harmful. The bill sort of attempts to tie this to specific mental health outcomes by saying you can't recommend content to kids that makes them anxious or depressed. But unfortunately, what the bill totally fails to understand is just how disingenuous state attorneys general are willing to be when making arguments in favor of their own political positions. So, for example, the attorney general of Mississippi, who I mentioned, or of Missouri, rather, who I mentioned, 
in their executive order banning gender affirming care, they cited a number of medical studies showing that trans people experience disproportionate rates of depression and anxiety. And they used that to justify their attempt to strip us of our basic rights and access to medically recommended health care that we need in order to live. Now, anyone who has been paying attention for more than two seconds knows that attorneys general are making similar arguments around content that kids encounter online and saying that simply encountering a video of a drag queen reading a storybook is going to make kids depressed or make kids experience gender dysphoria or make kids experience anxiety or suicidality. That's completely bogus. It's not supported by evidence at all, but that won't prevent these types of law enforcement officers from making those arguments. And what that will mean in practice is that platforms will simply suppress across the board content that they're worried might get them sued by state attorneys general. And they simply will not recommend it to young people. What that means in practice is that young people will be cut off from life-saving resources and information that they actually need in order to navigate this deeply challenging world that they're growing up in. Now, folks that are pushing COSA envision, for example, that this will mean that Instagram will stop recommending extreme dieting videos to young girls and instead recommend them positive or helpful videos. That is a complete misunderstanding of both how the law would function and how platforms will react when subjected to this kind of liability. And we actually know very well how they will react because we can look at SESTA-FOSTA, the last major time change to platforms' liability and obligations related to user-generated content. And what we know is that platforms suppressed content across the board rather than trying to make difficult determinations between could this content be seen as promoting sex trafficking or is this just an important video by a sex worker for other sex workers, giving them information that they might need to keep themselves safe? We're not going to try to make that determination. We're just going to censor both videos. The same will be true under COSA, where a company like Instagram or YouTube are not going to make a determination between whether a video is promoting eating disorders or has useful information for young people grappling with eating disorders and how they might find support or help. Instead, they'll simply suppress content related to this important but controversial topic for young people across the board. That doesn't make young people safer. In fact, it makes them less safe by cutting them off, as I said, from life-saving information and resources that they need. There's plenty more to say here, but I think the thing to understand with COSA is that it fundamentally gives state attorneys general the power to dictate what young people can see on the internet. And these are some of the worst people in the country that we're talking about. And we know exactly what they will do with that power because they are showing us right now with what they're trying to do with the power that they already have. So I'll pause there. That's my rant on COSA. Happy to answer any questions about that bill or any of these other bills or for how folks can get engaged in the week of action that we're organizing. My colleague, Sarah, who's doing a lot of the organizing around that, I think is also here. So Sarah, if you have anything, feel free to ask for the mic. And otherwise, I'll pass it back to Ryan and Natalie. And thanks so much for inviting me up. I'm sorry if I went on and on. No, that was awesome. That's great information. And I think you really drive home the point that the dangers of these sorts of bills, and especially with the way that gender affirming care has been crazily tied to child abuse in the U.S., there's a sinister element of that now that gets pulled into these bills that is terrifying. So I think we're getting close to the end here and I'll pass it to Natalie, but I just wanted to, to note that if people have questions, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or reach out to me over email. I'm at polk at isoc.org. And it would be great also if Evan, you or Sarah could post a link to your week of action in the chat for folks to see, but back to you, Natalie. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you so much, Evan, for sharing that important information and, you know, much love and respect for the advocacy that yourself and your organization is doing on these really crucial issues. As you mentioned, this is a critical time and the time to act is now to make sure that there are safe spaces for everyone online because the internet is for everyone. 
That's a very core part of the Internet Society's mission. So as we wrap up, I just wanted to remind folks about the note we made before. What can we as individuals do to stop these threats to encryption? Evan just gave a great list of resources and mentioned the Action Week. Please do go and check that out and participate as much as you're able to. Ryan mentioned that we have a pinned link to a blog post that the Internet Society wrote that has more information about how these bills put children at risk and what you can do about it, whether it's contacting your policymakers, signing our petition, joining the Global Encryption Coalition as a friend, or encouraging your organization to join. These are all things that we should be doing right now to help stop these threats to encryption. And... With that, I think that we have a wrap. As Ryan said, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. If you have any further questions, uh, reach out to others. We, we have some really great folks in attendance here who are doing really excellent advocacy on these issues. But the time to act is now. And, and I can't talk about that sense of <laughs> urgency. You know, I can't underline that enough. The time to act is now. And I really do appreciate everyone showing up. Feel free to reach out. Let's save encryption and let's save safe spaces for everyone online. Thanks so much, everyone.